a little boy walking around a military place where bodies are droping left and right. But this boy has no trouble with this scenario because he is cause for all of this. He's only interested in finding a woman named Asaka. Suddenly, he finds her being held at gunpoint by someone we don't know much about. Asaka is surprised to see the boy, Yagiri, somehow made it into the base where she was kept. The person holding her hostage threatens to hurt her if Yagiri comes closer, but he just stares at her, and then she falls down dead. Asaka doesn't know what Yagiri did, but he's just glad to have her back. Later, Yagiri wakes up by a different girl, who is shaking his cucumber. Sorry guys, I mean by shaking him. She introduces herself as Danara, and Yagiri asks what's wrong. But she's surprised how the f he has slept through a big incident that happened. There are bodies on the floor of the bus, and Danara doesn't know what they'll do. Outside, they see a tail moving, so Yogiri throws a microphone at one of the things that stabbed his classmate. It hurts a wyvern outside, making it react strangely. It charges at them, and Danara thinks they're doomed because they can't fight such a powerful beast. In a desperate move, she presses b**** against Yogiri, which makes him care just enough to do something. He says something, and the dragon drops dead before them. Danara is confused and doesn't understand what just happened. So Yagiri pulls out a video game to calm her down so they can talk. But she gets upset, thinking it's not the time to play games anymore. She asks if he doesn't want to leave the bus yet, but Yagiri doesn't see the rush since they're not sure if it's safe outside. Danara understands but wants him to take the situation seriously. Yagiri agrees and asks to be filled in on what happened. Danara explains they were on a field trip, riding the bus like usual. But when they went through a tunnel, they ended up in a sunny meadow, which is where they are now. At first, it was a pleasant yet confusing surprise when someone boarded the bus and introduced themselves as the sage Xiang. She seemed nice enough at first glance, but when the teacher asked the reasonable question of what's going on, she blasts his head without any hesitation decapitated him. She tells everyone that she doesn't intend to harm anyone directly, but if they make her angry, they might regret it. She tries to make a joke, but it's so unfunny that she ends up killing the driver out of frustration for her own lack of humor. She explains to the rest of the students that she brought them all here to become sages. In this world, sages rule, but sometimes they need to replenish their numbers, which is why they were summoned here. She raises her hands and causes most of the students to begin glowing as she installs a system in their bodies called Battle Song which comes with a status window. However, Danara didn't get one, so she isn't sure what it looks like. Sion explains that they've been given what this world calls gifts, and they'll need to use them well to become sages in the near future. They only have one month to achieve this goal, otherwise, they'll die. Danara raises her hand and asks what happened because she didn't get one of those gifts, but Sion just says that there are times when people aren't suited to receive magical gifts, so tough luck, you're out of luck. She's doomed to become nothing more than livestock in this world. With that out of the way, Sion tells them that their first quest will be starting soon, where a dragon will be attacking them, so they should try their best not to die. Danara's friend looks over her menu screen and sees information about the dragon that will be attacking soon. Danara still can't believe an actual dragon is going to attack. One member of their class gets everyone's attention and suggests that they work together to clear the mission. To do that, they need to know what abilities they have, so he asks everyone to reveal their gifts. The class complies and writes down their abilities to formulate a plan. However, Danara, who doesn't have an ability, can't participate. She wasn't the only one without an ability, there were three others, Aka, Shinzaki, and Hirokuru. Then there's also Yagui, who managed to sleep through the entire commotion undisturbed. But then again, it's not like he ever did anything other than sleep in the first place. After a while, the rest of the gifted classmates who were sharing their ability list start leaving without saying a word to those in the back who didn't receive one. Danara tries to wake Yagiri up so they can follow the rest of the class as they exit the bus, but the one who led the gifted class stops them. He explains that Yagiri didn't receive a gift, and while those who did have gained special abilities, the rest of the class are just regular people who are still struggling. Shinzaki asks the gifted class to protect those without gifts since they have the power to do so. However, the guy leading the gifted class thinks it would be a burden for them to protect people who are weak. So, they came up with a plan to ditch them and use them as bait. Everyone in the class agrees to this plan, leaving no one to appeal to for help. Another classmate uses her ability to cast charm on the giftless classmates, making them all look more attractive. Unfortunately, they're going to face the dragon, and it won't be a pleasant experience for them. The rest of the class leaves them to their fate, and they're clueless about what to do next. Things worsen as the dragon arrives and starts attacking. 
However, one classmate remains peacefully asleep in the back of the bus while the others face danger. Yagiri now realizes the seriousness of his situation in this unfamiliar world. He wonders how he'll charge his video game without any outlets available. On top of that, according to what they learned from the gifted class, there's likely only one dragon in the area, so it should be safe to go outside now that it's dead. Before they leave, Danara asks Yagiri if he did something to the dragon earlier, but he simply says he told it to die which she finds hard to believe. Despite her doubts, he steps out of the bus. There are three options for places they can go to, a hill, the city, or the forest. However, it's probably not a good idea to go into an unknown forest unprepared. Before a decision can be made, Danara notices something flying towards them. Yagiri asks if it's another dragon, but this time it's three of their classmates, Higashida, Fukuhara, and Hanakawa. She's surprised to see them flying in. So Yagiri asks if he should kill them just in case. Danara stops him, insisting they should at least hear them out before resorting to violence. But Yagiri points out that leaving the giftless behind to be killed isn't something a good person would do. Danara still doesn't want to have to kill anyone, but she acknowledges they may still be hostile towards them for no reason. The three gifted students are shocked to see that the dragon is dead and Danara is still alive. Their plan was to use their powers to turn her into a zombie and do terrible things to her, and they say all of this right in front of Danara herself. She realizes Yagiri may have been right about them not being good people and is suddenly much less opposed to killing them. Hikida launches a fireball powerful enough to melt straight through the bus and carve into a mountain behind them, showing the power difference between them and trying to force Danara into submission. Higashida says that in this world, he can do whatever he wants, and the first thing on his list is to harm Danara, along with the other two guys who have been dreaming about it for a long time. Danara is terrified by the thought of what they would do to her, but Yagiri tells her to calm down while he puts them in a situation for a civil discussion. He then points at Higashida and tells him to die. The others laugh, thinking Yagiri is just being strange, but to their utter shock, Higashida actually falls to the ground and dies. They don't understand what happened, but Yagiri explains that he told him to die, and he did. He then tells them not to move, but the other one drops to his knees to help his friend, and as a result, Yagiri tells him to die as well. Hanakawa is now the only one left, and Yagiri reiterates that if he moves at all, he'll be killed. Yagiri begins to explain his ability, but first, he instructs Hanakawa to check to make sure the others are actually dead. Hanakawa goes to them and starts trying to heal them with his ability, which allows him to help anyone recover from injuries, no matter how severe. However, his powers do nothing here because the people he's trying to heal are already dead. Hanakawa starts to say that Yogiri went too far with this, but Yogiri points out that they were the ones who came in here trying to harm Danara for nefarious purposes. Yogiri's ability is instant death to any target. If he simply thinks about wanting to kill someone, they will immediately die without exception. Hanakawa can't believe what he is hearing since that power is way too broken. Nonetheless, he tries to play it off and get in close for a sneak attack. However, Yogiri stops him before he can do anything stupid and informs him that he also has the ability to determine if there is any killing intent directed towards him. So when you combine the two abilities, literally anyone who has the intent of killing Yogiri may die just because they thought about harming him. Hanakawa breaks down, realizing that there is no way he can win against Yogiri. But Yogiri asks why he got so full of himself after just receiving his gift. Hanakawa explains that this isn't the first time they have come to this world. A while ago, the magicians of the Kingdom of Aman summoned them to defeat the Demon Lord. They went on adventures in this world for about a year, and once they finally defeated the Demon Lord, they returned to Earth. However, it seemed like no one on Earth remembered them disappearing for an entire year. According to Hanakawa, after they were returned to Earth, they found out that only a few hours had passed since they were initially summoned. Yagiri takes that to mean that there is a way for them to return to Earth. He raises his hand to finish off Hanakawa to prevent any future issues with him. Hanakawa begs to be spared by Yagiri. He tries to get Danara to help him out here, but after what he said when he initially came here, she is the last person who would ever want to do him a favor. As a last resort, Hanakawa pulls out a rare slave collar item, which will make the wearer unable to disobey the commands of the first person they see. He puts the collar on and is now bound to the will of Danara. However, she doesn't want to deal with him, so she offloads the task of being his master onto Yogiri. Since Hankawa can't disobey orders now, Yogiri decides to leave him alive for a while. However, he tells him to go stand in the forest full of magical beasts and wait. Yogiri also instructs him to leave behind any valuable items he has. Hankawa is forced to drop his entire inventory worth of loot from his last summoning. 
Danara questions if Yagiri may be being a little too harsh by taking all of his stuff away and making him wait in a deadly forest. However, they aren't exactly friends, and there is no telling when he might betray them in the end. Danara then asks why Yogiri is sticking with her since she could also betray him at some point. But Yogiri responds that if it happens, then it happens, he's fine with it since he's the one who chose to trust her. Danara blushes a little and asks why he's going through such lengths to protect her, even though they have basically never spoken to each other before. But Yagiri doesn't really know, if he had to think of a reason, then it would probably be because of her melons. Danara gets red in the face from embarrassment and accuses him of only wanting her for her body as well. Elsewhere, Sion is in bed and very pleased with herself when someone named Yuchai comes in to give her a report on the students she summoned. They have cleared the first mission, but there were four fatalities in the process. Sion assumes the fatalities were from the students who weren't able to receive gifts, but while two of them did die, there were also two S-rank gift holders that died in the process. That's a big surprise, especially since they died without any warning. But Sion doesn't think it's anything they really need to be worried about, so she tells Yuchai that he can handle it any way he sees fit. Yagiri and Danra finally make it to the city gates after several hours of walking but they see the guards closing the gates as they approach. Yagiri expected as much since it's getting late, so they rush over to get their attention before they get locked out for the night. Danra goes up to one of the guards, but they can't understand a single word she is saying. The two get brought in and wait under a tent while the guards go get their boss to handle the situation. After a few moments, Masahiko arrives, annoyed that he still has to work so late into the night. He understands Japanese, much to the relief of Danara, and he already seems to have an idea of what is going on here. The rest of their classmates came through town earlier that day, so he has already dealt with them. Normally, he would charge a toll in order to enter the city, but he receives clear instructions from Sion not to get in the way of the sage candidates, so he won't be charging them today. Yagiri asks about the other sage candidates Masahiko mentioned coming through and recalls that they had mentioned something about going to the capital so he asks which direction that would be. But while Masahiko is not allowed to get in their way, there is no incentive for him to help them. So Yagiri gets up to leave. As they are passing by, Masahiko takes a good look at Danara's plots and says he wouldn't mind if Danara stayed in his mansion for the night, and he offers him also so much fun in the night. She doesn't seem interested and grabs Yagiri's hand to run away with a look of scary on her face. She may not have liked the guy, but the reason she dragged Yagiri away so quickly was because she was afraid he would kill the guy for what he said. Yagiri doesn't know why she would think he is the kind of person to do something like that. But then again, he did kill his classmates back there for just moving, so it doesn't seem out of character for him. She moves on to another topic and talks about how amazing this town looks. It even has people that look like beast folk. And speaking of beast folk, she gets approached by a cat girl called Myriu. Myriu can tell that it's their first time in town and asks if they might be in trouble or in need of any kind of help from her because if they are, she's there to assist with anything. She seems a little too friendly for someone they just met, so Yogiri asks what she stands to gain by helping them out here. She doesn't even try to hide it and says she just wants to get along with all the sage candidate boys because they are all down bad and dying of thirst. And as a cat girl, if the sage boys become successful in the future, she can roll in that ten on seduction and live the easy life from then on. Danra doesn't agree with the thought process, but she can at least respect Myriu's honesty on the matter. Myriu goes on to say that Danra doesn't need to worry because she won't attempt seduction on anyone who already has a girlfriend. She is well aware of what Yandir girls are willing to do to keep their man, so she isn't going to risk it. Her seductive intentions aside, they don't see anything else shady about Myriu, and Danra wanted to take a look around town anyway before it gets too dark, so they decided to accept the cat girl's help. What's the worst that could happen? It's not like this is a trap or anything, but it was a trap. The two men end up surrounded by a bunch of thieves after they spend the entire evening shopping in town. So Yagiri tries to de-escalate the situation by asking if they will accept money to leave them alone. The thieves agree that money would be nice, but what they are really after is talentless sage candidates like Yagiri and Danara. Whenever Sion goes and summons a bunch of sage candidates, the ones with good gifts often end up going wild with their power. And the thieves have gotten sick of all the Dragon Ball fights happening in their backyards and bringing down the property value. 
However, they are weak compared to the gift bearers, so it's not like they can complain about it either. So they go after the weak sage candidates to make themselves feel better. They plan to kill Yagiri and then make use of Danara as irresistible assets. Now that he has a clear grasp on their intentions and has failed to de-escalate, Yagiri is going to have to make a call to the local mortician. Danara tries to get Mayuriyu to call it off because someone is definitely going to die here. And it's not going to be Yagiri, but she thinks they are just bluffing because there is no way someone without a gift could be so powerful in this world. Danara has done her best to save them, but it's time to make that call. First, they're going to need five coffins for the people behind Yagiri, but he tries to take it easy on the rest of the people there, so he tells this guy to just half die, essentially turning him into a vegetable. That was still a little extreme. He tries going for individual body parts instead. But that is still pretty bad regardless, I think he is just playing with them, and having fun. He decides to put an end to this. Mayuriyu realizes that she messed up big time and tries to beg for her life with her sob story of needing to make money to help her sick brother. But Yagiri raises the point that she tried to kidnap and sell them into slavery, so she isn't going to be getting a redemption arc either. As Yagiri is ready to put an end to this, he tells both her and the last guy to just die. However, this time nothing happens, and they thank the heavens that they are still alive. But they aren't going to stick around for Yagiri to try again, so they both make a run for it. Danara asks him why he chose to let them go, but he didn't. His kill success rate is always 100%. So just when Mayuriyu thought she was a safe distance away, the death kicked in. And believe it or not, she dies. Oh yeah, the last guy ends up dying too, no offend guys, but tell how much you care about the last guy. He is just an Anor NPC. With all the attackers dead, Yogiri and Danara begin to walk off. However, they are called back by the city's guards who got news of the abnormally high number of coffins requested from the mortician. So they want to have a little chat with him about what just happened. Yogiri tries to lie his way out of this and just says that he found these guys on the forest already. But the guard isn't falling for his excellent deception tactics because she saw the whole thing. Those guys suddenly fell dead just before they could attack. Danara can't believe Edelgard is making them the suspects after they were the ones who got attacked first. And if she was watching the entire time, why didn't she do something to help when they were clearly in trouble? Edelgard makes the claim that she was just trying to find out who those guys are selling all their victims to. So they were going to let them kidnap Yagiri and Danara and just follow them until they found the guy they were looking for. She also tells them that the guards have received the sage's protection, so the gifts they have as sage candidates won't work on them and they should just come quietly if they don't want any trouble. However, one of Edelgard's men uses his appraisal ability on both and finds that neither of them actually possesses any sage abilities, so they can't explain how Yogiri could have possibly managed to do this, and thus they have no grounds to make an arrest. Edelgard admits defeat and tells them they are free to go, and her subordinate apologizes for his commander's rudeness. Yogiri tells him it's fine, but as an apology, it would be nice if he could hook them up with a place to stay for the night. The man doesn't disappoint, and Yogiri and Danara now have a really fancy inn to stay at. While Danara is still taking in the beauty of the place, Yogiri asks if she would like to share the same room with him while they are here. She finds that to be a bit embarrassing, so Yogiri offers to just have their rooms be next to each other. What do you think guys, how smooth our f*** is? Danara gets to her room and marvels at the luxury it provides. As she jumps on the huge bed, she starts thinking about Yogiri and marvels at the request to share a room with her. She wonders what kind of pervy things he must have been thinking about to ask for such a thing. Then again, this is literally the first time she's been away from Yogiri since they got to this world. And without him there to protect her, she would either be dead or enslaved thrice over. She wonders if Yogiri really likes her after all, but she thinks he already made it clear that he was specifically after those soft cushions of hers. While she squeezes her face into a pillow out of embarrassment, she hears a sound coming from the room and looks up to find a ghost floating over her bed. She's freaked out and screamed fuck at first, but then she realizes that the ghost happens to look a lot like her sister. However, her sister is still alive, and this must be their family guardian spirit. The guardian spirit makes it clear that she wants to have nothing to do with Danara's sister ever again. She is here to help Danara in her time of need since she is facing a very troubling series of events. Danara wonders why the spirit didn't help her when the dragon attacked or when she was almost sold into slavery twice in the same day. The guardian spirit, Moko, is honest and tells her that she is scared to death by Yagiri. That really tells you it's bad because she's already dead. With the kind of power Yagiri has, if she were to appear recklessly in front of him and make a bad impression, she could be erased from existence in an instant. 
so she wants Danara to tell Yagiri about her before she shows herself to him, so he won't think of her as a threat. Danara says she'll tell him tomorrow but then asks what kind of help Moko was going to give her. Moko explains that since she is a spirit, she can protect Danara from most things aside from physical attacks. In fact, she was the one who prevented the Battle Song Sage gift from being installed into her body back on the bus. Danara gets angry because Moko basically put her at a permanent disadvantage in this world. But Moko doesn't see the problem since she thought Danara would have been opposed to a random person putting something suspicious inside her body. The Sage Gift certainly has its advantages, but once you allow it to be installed, then Sion basically has control over you for the rest of your life, so it's not the best trade-off. Besides, Moko's goal is to ensure that Danara returns to Earth to become the successor of their family martial arts technique. While Danara certainly would like to go home, she's pretty much stuck just relying on Yagiri because she is so weak. But that's where Moko is going to work her magic, as she will teach Danara all the centuries of fighting techniques she knows of. The next morning, Danara meets Yogiri downstairs after not getting any sleep the whole night because she is jumping up and down all night. Sorry guys I mean, Moko's midnight training arc. She asks Yogiri if they are going to meet up with the rest of their classmates after this, and that is something he wanted to talk to her about. They both meet with a woman called Celestina, who has been helping Yogiri by looking up the locations of all his classmates and how to get to them from here, as well as getting language translation and status concealment items for them. She made him a charger for his game console. I've got to say, Celestina is really earning that paycheck. She has also prepared two tickets for the both of them to reach the capital by train with a noon departure time. Yagiri thanks her for all her hard work, and if you are wondering how they've been paying for all the stuff they've gotten, they still have tons of gold they robbed from the three returner students. Yagiri asks Celestina if she can take their leftover gold and invest it for them, and she does it with no issues. The two move on to continue their journey to join up with the rest of their classmates and are heading toward the primal forest because Celestina thinks they will head there to train. But midway through the ride, Yagiri senses something and pushes Danara down to avoid a slash that destroys the entire train car. One of those Dragon Ball Sage fights is happening nearby, and the collateral damage is really high. Elsewhere, one of this world's sages receives a report from Edelgard about the situation that occurred earlier, but they still don't know what happened since the guy who was still alive hasn't been able to give them an answer. This was the guy whose eyes Yogiri told to die, but they do not know about his ability, so they are confused in trying to figure out the cause. Even after ripping out one of the guy's eyes and using healing magic to grow a new one back in place, he still can't see. The sage then tries to use her vampire nature to turn him into one and give him regenerative powers, but that doesn't work either. Their experiments are cut short soon after as someone bursts through the wall with a sword in hand. Returning to Yagiri and Danara, who are still on the destroyed train, Yagiri can tell that they were not the intended targets for that attack, but it is still pretty dangerous for them to be here. It looks like a sage is attacking a robot that the people of this world call aggressors, and the battle is reshaping the landscape. Danara asks Yagiri if he can just kill them because they are in the way, but while Yagiri may be a killing machine, he still has rules that even he has to follow. He can't just go around killing people because they inconvenience him, and those guys didn't intentionally send the blast his way, so there would be no reason to kill them. But then again, the sage seems to be a piece of so Yagiri decides to kill him after all. Back with the vampire sage, the person that attacked has just blown away the entire castle, but with her innate healing ability, she was able to just tank the explosion. She did something terrible to this guy's lover, but once again, nobody cares about him, plus she's immortal, so she doesn't even bother killing him and just chucks him off the roof. She then instructs Edelgard to find Yagiri since she wants to figure out how he managed to kill all those thieves. Meanwhile, after Yagiri killed the sage, the robot does the smart thing and tries to negotiate things peacefully rather than fight, but it doesn't have anything that Yagiri wants. Instead, Danara gets something later that day. The Vampire Sage holds a meeting with Sion over the dead sage they just found near the train tracks, and she suspects that Yogiri might be behind this. Sion doesn't really care but leads her to do as she sees fit. So, the Vampire Sage calls on one of her subordinates and tells him to get the zombie army ready. Back to Yogiri and Danara, after a ton of walking, they can finally see the city of Hanabusa, which looks a lot like a Japanese city. While Dominar is still all peppy and full of energy, Yagiri is absolutely winded after the long journey. He's got a kill-death ratio that basically caused the extinction of the forest monsters and some bandits for good measure. After realizing she's been of no help at all this entire trip, Danara apologizes but asks that he tell her when they are in danger so she won't be acting so carefree and naive. 
before they go. Danara asks if his being tired after using his ability means he has a limit to how many times it can be used, but Yagiri reassures her that he has no cooldown on it and the developers never patched it out, so he's free to spam instant death as much as he wants. They head into the city and are amazed by its futuristic appearance. As they walk through its streets, they come across a hotel that Celestina had suggested they use, so they decide to head in and stay for a while before they do anything else. Inside the hotel, they come across one of their classmates, Takabana, who greets them normally like he didn't abandon them to their doom. Danara asks why he is here since, from what they know, he should still be with the rest of the class in the forest. He responds, saying he split up from the rest of the group because he didn't agree with their inefficient methods of gaining levels. He had something much more beneficial for himself in mind, slavery. As soon as he got here, he learned that slaves were still a thing, so when asked how many he wanted, he said yes. These are the primary members of his harem, Erica, Stephanie, Chelsea, Euphemia, and Riza. These are quite the array of different girls, but they all have one thing in common. From now on, they hate Danara. Takabana tells them to shut up for a bit while he talks to his classmates, and while he does that, Yogiri tells Danara that he seems really confident, so he must have a strong ability of some kind. They still don't know what his ability is, but he has been like that since he was in high school. He had the ladies flocking to him, so he was always a bit of a narcissist, and he would switch girlfriends more like Dan Bilzerian. Kakabana speaks up and says that since they've met here by chance, then would Danara like to become his slave, sorry, lover? She's petrified by the absurdity of his statement, but he assures her that it is fine since if she's worried about what will happen to Yagiri, while he usually doesn't swing that way. He'll make an exception for Yagiri as well. Neither of them can believe what they are hearing, so they ask what makes him so confident to make a request like that. Takabana reveals that he has the class of dominator, meaning he is able to absolutely dominate any weaker beings. That is a pretty powerful ability. But if Takabana is here, how does he intend to get stronger if all the others are busy training while he's lounging around here? But that isn't much of a problem for him since his ability is also broken. He explains that after the class had safely made it to the town and were celebrating, he was approached by one of his classmates, Haruto, who told him about the true nature of his ability. Haruto has the class of consultant, so he came to give Takabana some insight on what he should do from now on. Right now in the class, everyone is avoiding him because of his class of dominator, and Haruto doesn't want a fight to break out among them. So, he informs Takabana that the true power behind his ability is a pyramid scheme. He can go buy a bunch of cheap slaves and make them go out and fight for him. Then, if the slaves win, he gets experience and can make the defeated people become his slaves as well. So, his network of slavery will only keep on growing as time passes, and his XP gain will be exponential. That's certainly useful information, but the menu screen didn't have any information like that, so he questions how Haruto was able to figure this out. Haruto revealed that his ability allows him to see the hidden details of anyone's ability, but that still doesn't answer the question of why he's giving a free consultation like this. As a consultant, his chances of successfully becoming a sage are tied to the success of his classmates, so he wants everyone to do the best they can do to avoid ending up as livestock on the chopping block. That basically means that at this very moment, Takabana's number of slaves is rising, and he is gaining levels without having to do anything at all. So, he re-extends the offer and asks Danara to become his slave, but she still values her freedom. Takabana agrees to leave and says he will give her time to think about the proposal. At least he isn't being pushy about it, so he isn't much of a threat to them for now. But Yagiri points out that it might actually be safer for Danara if she were to go with him since she would be close to the top in the pyramid scheme. However, that's still not an option. It seems there's a lot going on with Yagiri and Danara's situation. Yagiri has been asleep for three days, leaving Danara to handle things by herself. However, trouble arises as a zombie army invades the city, and Danara finds herself targeted by someone she can't see. With Moko's warning, Danara calls Yogiri for help, and he quickly takes action, sensing the threat and eliminating it. Meanwhile, Takabana, having noticed Erika's sudden death, suspects foul play and investigates. Euphemia suggests that Erika might have been jealous of Danara and attempted to eliminate her. As they try to leave, Riza tries to stop them by using an ice spell to block their path. But Yogiri easily breaks the ice by commanding it to melt. He shows he's stronger by destroying Riza's wand and warns her that he can kill anything with just his thoughts. Riza, scared, admits she's a skilled wand master and gives him another wand she had hidden. She was ordered to capture Danara, but other servants got the same order. Danara almost gets attacked, but she fights back and gets her first 
Riza tries to use this distraction to attack. But Yogiri had warned her not to try anything sneaky, so he killed her. Only a little girl and her dolls are left to fight. But Yogiri easily destroys the dolls and goes to finish off the girl. Realizing the futility of resistance, Chelsea surrenders and provides Yogiri with valuable information. In a desperate move, Takabana decides to unleash his last resort, a swarm of cockroaches. Despite their seemingly insignificant nature, this large number of cockroaches poses a serious threat, capable of causing suffocation or other deadly outcomes. However, before the attack can commence, Euphemia expresses concern about antagonizing someone with Yogiri's purported abilities. Undeterred, Takabana insists on proceeding, driven by his desire to assert dominance as a dominator. As the cockroaches prepare to attack, Yogiri swiftly identifies Takabana as the source of the killing intent and eliminates him instantly, thwarting the threat posed by the cockroach army. With Takabana eliminated, the threat of the cockroach army dissipates, but the presence of the insects prompts Yogiri and Danra to vacate the room swiftly. Meanwhile, Stephanie and Euphemia remain with Takabana's lifeless body. Euphemia, now liberated from Takabana's influence, decides to depart. However, upon reaching the surface, she encounters a desolate wasteland where a once lush forest stood, now consumed by a massive darkness. In this bleak landscape, the vampire sage intercepts Euphemia, sinking her fangs into her and transforming her into a vampire. The sage seeks to extract information from Euphemia about the recent events, using her newfound vampiric abilities to compel her to divulge all she knows. As Yogiri and Danara emerge onto the streets, they are confronted with the dire reality of the zombie army they had previously disregarded. Meanwhile, the vampire sage, having turned Euphemia into a member of her bloodline, inquires about Yogiri's ability, intrigued by its rumored power to bring death to any target. She wonders if it could potentially end her own immortal life. In the besieged city, chaos reigns as panicked civilians experience the horrors of a zombie apocalypse firsthand. Meanwhile, Yogiri and Danara find refuge in an alleyway, strategizing their next steps amidst the chaos and uncertainty surrounding them. Yogiri assesses the situation, noting that the zombies are slow moving, which gives them a chance to escape the city if they are cautious. Danara questions Yogiri's intentions, expressing concern for the safety of the city's inhabitants. However, Yogiri reaffirms his stance, emphasizing that he never intended to be a hero in this world. He admits that his main priority is protecting Danara, showing little concern for others. The mayor of the town is really mad because the leader of the undead army, Masayuki, came to town without warning and is hurting people for no reason. A vampire named Lady Lane gave Masayuki permission to control the area, so he thinks he can do whatever he wants. Masayuki tells Ryuta, who used to be his friend and fellow warrior, to calm down because they fought together in a battle. But Ryuta insists that Masayuki and his undead army leave the city right away. However, Masayuki says he has permission from Lady Lane to do whatever he wants, including hurting people to find someone named Yagiri. Ryuta has to give in because Lady Lane ordered it, so he gives Masayuki the key to the city. Masayuki then tells the zombies to stop attacking and gives the people of the city one hour to bring him Yagiri, and another person named Danara, either dead or alive. If they don't succeed, Masayuki threatens to kill them instead. He's made sure that no one can escape by locking the gates to the city. If people want to survive, they have to hurry up and start looking for the teenagers. Ryuta isn't happy that the citizens are being used like pawns in Masayuki's game, but there's nothing he can do because the boss lady said so. Now, people on the streets are running around like crazy trying to find Yogiri and Danara. They're even scarier than the zombies. Danara doesn't understand why they're being chased so much. Maybe it's because Yagiri killed one of the sages, which was a big deal. Killing people recklessly might cause more problems in the future. Just as Yagiri thinks this, three people come up behind him, ready to kill him to capture him. Yagiri warns them that he won't hesitate to kill anyone who attacks him, but they ignore him and attack anyway. As expected, Yogiri ends up killing one of them. The other two run away after seeing their friend killed so easily. Yogiri wonders why Masayuki thought the thugs would be useful in capturing him when he can kill anyone easily. Maybe Masayuki hoped Yogiri would have a moral code against killing civilians, but Yogiri doesn't have any weaknesses like that. Still, he doesn't like the idea of innocent people being used against him, so he decides it might be a good idea to negotiate with Masayuki personally. They both head to the town square to meet with Masayuki, and the place smells really bad, like death and decay. When they reach Masayuki, he's pretty upset that he didn't get to kill more people before Yogiri turned himself in. Masayuki asks if Yogiri plans to sacrifice himself for the citizens of the city, but Yogiri has a different plan. 
Masayuki doesn't think Yagiri has much choice since he's the one in power, but Yagiri wants to make a deal. He asks Masayuki to remove the barrier around the city in exchange for using the train to leave. Masayuki gets really angry and refuses, saying Yagiri has no right to ask for favors. Yagiri agrees to sweeten the deal by sparing Masayuki's life, even though he's not a nice person. But Masayuki doesn't appreciate the offer and orders his undead army to kill Yagiri. He thinks his army is immune to Yagiri's magic, but Yagiri tells them all to die. And somehow, they do, for good this time. The smile on Masayuki's face fades. His soul left his body, as he starts to wish he had taken Yagiri's initial offer. His immortal army has been defeated in an instant, and not wanting to be next in line, Ryuta throws his hands up and sells Masayuki out. Masayuki isn't even mad that Ryuta is ditching him, but what he wants to know is how something that is already dead could possibly be killed. It's all simple really, you say they are dead, but they were still moving, so Yagiri considers them to still be alive. And if that doesn't make sense to you, it doesn't matter because this is Yagiri's world and I am the of world, and he gets to decide what dead means. Masayuki can't stand for such absurdity and begins to transform so he can fight Yagiri at full power. But Armik is Giga Chad, so he doesn't play by the rules and just kills him before he can finish transforming. There's still the problem of needing to take down the barrier around the city, but that shouldn't be a problem as Ryuta seems more than happy to do whatever Yagiri asks of him. He pleads with Yagiri to spare his life, but Yagiri never intended to kill him anyway, as he only ever kills in self-defense. Ryuta explains that Masayuki was ordered by the Vampire Sage Lane to kill Yagiri. The city and the surrounding area are controlled by Lane, so is her subordinate. Masayuki was put in charge of looking after the city. That's a bit confusing to them since they got called here by sign to become sages, and now they are being hunted down by another sage. Just then, Moko appears and informs the two that some spiritual manipulation was targeted at this area, and all of a sudden, all the citizens of the city now have killing intent directed towards Yagiri and Danara. If it's a spiritual attack making the citizens act like this, then maybe the barrier could block it out. But as Ryuta tries to use the key to change the barrier settings, he finds that he has been locked out of the controls, which could only mean that Lane has taken it over and is the one behind this. From a great distance away, Lane is carrying out her plan, but Euphemia tells her that what she's doing is really risky. Lane already knows that Yogiri was able to kill Takabana over a long distance by tracing his control of the cockroaches, and with power like that, He's already far above the power of any sage. That's exactly why Euphemia believes they should just let him do his thing and step aside. The mind-controlled people begin attacking Yagiri one by one, and he is forced to continuously kill them as they attack. He has had something like this happen to him before, where one guy tried a bunch of things just to see how Yagiri would react to them. But in the end, he can always just kill them all if it comes down to it. Ryuta is having a really hard time seeing all of his precious citizens dropping like flies right in front of his eyes. Meanwhile, Lane is still doing her thing outside the city, and as that darkness monster from before is approaching, it works out in her favor because now she can cause Yagiri's death without any direct killing intent against him. She decides now is a good time to put her backup plan into action and duplicates her body several times in the sky. In the city, the darkness has arrived within the city borders, and it is turning everything that it comes in contact with into sand, heading straight for them. At the same time, Lane explains that she created her clones with all information about Yagiri being removed from their brains, so with no knowledge of who Yagiri is, there should be no way for them to hold any hostility towards him, and thus Yagiri shouldn't be able to kill them. She decides to use the darkness as a cue to begin her attack, ordering the clones to carpet bomb the city once the darkness dies, as she expects Yogiri to be able to kill it. In the city, people watch in horror as the darkness tears through the architecture, leaving nothing but dust in its wake. They believe there's nothing anyone can do to stop it, but Yogiri could definitely do something if he wanted to. He has a bad feeling about this, but at the same time, he can't leave that thing to just kill everyone, so he decides to confront it. After the darkness kills Lane's carpet bombing strategy takes effect and more destruction rains down upon the city, Yagiri can see the attack, but he can't sense any hostility, almost as though something is just attacking the city indiscriminately. This must be the work of whoever was testing him with the civilians. While Yagiri is analyzing the situation intensely, he gets distracted by Danara's presence, which reminds him what he is fighting for. So he gets up to solve the problem, but that's easier said than done since he doesn't know where the attacks are coming from. Danara looks up and sees something unexpected. The bombs hitting the city are actually all the clones of Lane sacrificing themselves into the ground. 
They realize that this is Lane's countermeasure against Yagiri's instant death, and he can't really do much about it since she isn't targeting him directly, and the copies are blowing themselves up so fast that he can't even see them. Ayaka destroys the floor, and as the other four witches lie defeated on the ground, she de his ability class is a mayor, so he's able to see everything in the town at once and uses the information he has to find out the next place that will get bombarded. He then teleports them all there, and as the clone is about to hit them, Yogiri makes it die before prompting Moko to use her guardian spirit jazz to create a shield around them. The shield was some protective plating that can be worn under clothing, but thanks to Moko's guardian spirit thing, she is able to turn it into anything from a shield to a suit of armor. Finally, Danara isn't dead weight anymore. All of Lane's clones have been defeated, and Euphemia is telling her that she messed up when she decided to go after Yogiri. But she still doesn't see the problem since she can just create more clones to attack again. Just then, the full scope of the instant death hits, and Lane realizes her mistake. Still, she didn't want to die anyway. Elsewhere, a little girl wakes up from a nap in a coffin and receives a pre-recorded message from Lane, telling her that she is a copy of her that was made to be its own separate person. This was done to avoid attacks from Yogiri, but we'll get back to that later. As Yogiri and Danara are about to set off from the city, now that they've received some transportation from Ryuta. Meanwhile, we finally get to see what the other students have been up to. We meet Ruko, who is a samurai class. After defeating a monster, she enters her tent where a girl called Carol is standing. Carol stole Ruko's phone because she wanted to get a look at the app she had for monitoring Yogiri. It seems they were both tasked with spying on him back on Earth. But as they check the monitor, they are greeted with horrifying news, Yogiri's first gate is open, and Danara has been put in charge of driving the jeep. However, from the way they nearly died right there, it's clear that she doesn't know a damn thing about driving. So she wants to switch with Yogiri, but he's already fast asleep, so it looks like she's on her own for this one. Since she wasn't paying attention, Danara is about to crash into a boulder on the road while Yogiri is having a wonderful dream involving a woman. We get a little backstory of who this woman is, and she is seen signing a contract for a job interview. She finds it a little concerning that there's a death waiver involved, but she's in too deep to back out now, and those bills aren't going to pay themselves, so she goes along with it. She asks if this is some kind of organization, but her employer assures her that everything that goes on here is mostly legal. He tells her that this facility researches curses, so her job will be to take care of a monster. She has led down a creepy red hallway and asks where they are heading, so the employer informs her that she is tasked with looking after a being whom they have dubbed Alpha Omega from the description given. Asaka wonders if it might be a human, but the employer doesn't really know as he has never risked seeing the thing for himself. Alpha Omega has the frightening ability to kill anything just by thinking about it, so they brought in Asaka to be its teacher. It's already dangerous enough as it is, but imagine a toddler with no sense of right or wrong, having that kind of power. That's where Asaka comes in. But if you're wondering why she was selected for this dangerous job, it's because she's the only one who showed up. They get to the bottom of the elevator, so the employer hands her a piece of paper and tells her, you're on your own now, before leaving her to deal with a being she's got no other choice than to go in. But they shouldn't blame her if the world gets doomed because of something she did. She enters a room that has an artificial environment being generated and walks over to the house illustrated on the incredibly well-drawn map. Once there, she calls out to see if anyone is home and eventually comes across a little boy in the center room. She was anxious before, but now she's just enraged by the fact that the government locked up a child in this underground base. She's not going to stand around and let this kid become a meat, so she forcibly drags him outside and throws him into the creek so he can play for once. Yagiri looks stunned for a moment, but then points his finger at Asaka and kills a monster that was hiding behind her. There's no concrete answer on what that thing was, but things like that show up from time to time and try to kill him. They probably got in by hiding in her shadow, but it's dead now, so there's no reason to be worried anymore. Yogiri speaks up and says he would love to play, but it's getting really late now, so it would be better if they did that tomorrow. Asaka realizes she may have gotten a little carried away, and apologizes before finally introducing herself to him. But more importantly, Yogiri tells her he's hungry, and it finally sets in that she is the adult in the room, so she's got to cook. In the kitchen, there is a fully stocked pantry, but all that is useless if you got no cooking skills. She really needs to get something ready before Yogiri gets out of the bath though, so she goes for the broke college student classic, a cup of ramen. Luckily for her, the Yogiri has never tasted ramen before, so he is really happy with his dinner. While he eats, Asaka thinks of a name for him. She ultimately decides to name him after a dog, which was how he got the name Yogiri. 
From this moment on, she takes on the role of being his mother figure and taking care of him. These were fond memories for Yagiri, but he is woken up when Danare yells that the road to the capital is blocked. She is surprised that he can sleep through her reckless driving, but he can't help it since he's tired from killing all those zombies back in the city. Besides, he doesn't even understand why they need to head to the capital in the first place. After all, their end goal is to get back to their original world, and to do that, they are trying to find the sage Shane. So, even if they don't head to the capital, there should still be other ways available to locate her. With that in mind, they decide to turn around and find another way past this mountain. But as Danara is backing up, she accidentally rams into a dragon that was standing behind them. They get out to assess the situation, but the dragon attacks, leaving Yagiri with no choice but to kill it. However, that wasn't the only dragon, as there was a whole flock of them, and they are all honed in and ready to blast them clean off the face of the earth with fire. Unfortunately for them, they were up against Yagiri, so moments later, they all dropped dead. They were forced to wipe out an entire population of dragons. But if you think about it, this is dragon territory, so Yogiri just pulled up and committed mass genocide in their front lawn. However, things aren't over yet as a golden thunder dragon soon appears. However, the gold dragon doesn't seem to have any killing intent aimed at them, so Yogiri sees no reason to kill it. After a few moments, the dragon says they can pass and then tries to fly away in a hurry so it doesn't get killed. Since the dragon can talk, Yogiri calls it back under threat of being killed, and they are introduced to this little girl. Danara wonders why the huge dragon turned into this little girl. But don't let the details bother you right now. Yogiri asks the important question of why the dragons attacked him and Danara in the first place. The girl explains that they were trying to test if Yogiri was worthy of meeting the Swordmaster, but he has no idea who the Swordmaster is. The dragon can't believe they came all the way out here with no intention of meeting the master, but they just want to get to the capital, so there's no reason to take a detour now. The dragon pleads with them to follow her to the master since her job was to bring promising individuals to him, so she can't return empty-handed after losing her entire dragon army. The swordmaster is supposedly on equal terms with a sage, so Yagiri agrees to meet him since he might have some clues on how they can return to their original world. Plus, they were kind of stuck here anyway. The dragon promises that if they come with her to meet the swordmaster, then she will personally take them to the capital. She introduces herself as Attila and guides them to the location of the Swordmaster. When they arrive, they find a lot of people standing around, as they are also here to meet the Swordmaster and have a chance at becoming the next Divine King. One of the guys there thinks it must be against the rules to come here by car since everyone else had to walk, but the Swordmaster himself says he has no problem with it. You may think the Swordmaster is a nice guy. But you'd be wrong, as the first order of business after he arrives is for everyone to kill each other until there are less than half remaining. Yogiri didn't even want to come here in the first place, so he asks if he can just go since he isn't going to participate. Thus, the Sword Master makes up a rule that no one is allowed to escape, and the bloodshed begins as the participants start killing each other. As some people begin to target him, Yogiri sees no choice other than to defend himself, but this time he doesn't need to, as someone steps in to protect him and Danara from danger. This guy seems to actually be pretty decent, but he is praising the Sword Master way too much. He says there is no way the Sword Master would ever actually want them to kill one another, so it must have just been a test to see if they would act dishonorably just because he said so. However, Yogiri notices some magicians casting an ominous spell in the background, so he deals with them. The good knight continues the praise, suggesting that the Sword Master must have killed the magicians for not acting honorably. They also notice a guy who was cosplaying as Gojo that was bisected. But he's still alive and kicking, so he asks Danara to put that rainbow-colored stone in his hand. She's freaked out but does as he says, and as he holds the gem, he returns to his unharmed body. The Swordmaster has had enough killing for one day, so he tells everyone to stop and follow him because he is continuing the test elsewhere. Attila pleads with Yagiri to keep going along with the trial because if he wins and becomes the next Divine King, then she will get a promotion and become his attendant. Since they haven't gotten any information yet, they see no harm in continuing with the trial for the meantime. But this is getting more annoying than Yagiri would have hoped. They follow the Swordmaster, and along the way, the knight who helped them introduces himself as Rick. The bisected one is called Lonel. And now that introductions are out of the way, Yogiri asks what the big deal is about becoming the Divine King. Rick explains that the Divine King was a person who sealed away the Dark God long ago. But even though the Dark God is sealed, it is still a threat as there are many people working to revive him. Meanwhile, in the back, Danara asks Lonel what that stone was that healed him. 
He explains that these are a polog that can heal serious injuries and also be used for GEA games. He has always had terrible luck since he was born, so he would always end up in terrible situations. And more recently, he ended up getting sacrificed by a weird cult. He thought he was dead for sure, but then a goddess appeared, who is hot as f giving him apology gems to make up for his terrible life. Aside from injuries, he can also trade the gems for random items. But with his bad luck, he ends up just getting a brush. He used up most of his crystals on that one, but he gets new ones every midnight depending on how bad his luck for the day was. The rest of the group disappears into a barrier, and as they follow, they find themselves before a huge tower. Attila seems to have been left behind due to the barrier, so it seems like only those that are participating in the trial can enter. They enter the tower and head up to the top where the Swordmaster shows them the seal created by the last divine king, holding hundreds of monsters and the Dark God. Danara can see a girl in the middle stabbing herself along with the Dark God. One other participant, Frederica, tries to launch an attack at the Dark God to kill it once and for all. But the barrier slows down time so it may take hundreds of years for the attack to finally reach. And one piece might have ended by then. The goal for the night selection exam is for them to accumulate 100 points before they get to the ground. And they can't cheat by jumping off the side of the tower either. Danara wonders if Yagiri's power would work on the Dark God even with the time delay. But he looks like he feels guilty about something. He usually has a rule about not killing things unless he has a reason to do so. But Yagiri was feeling a little off from all the miasma in the area, so he wanted to see if he could find the source and get rid of it. This means he already killed the Dark Lord in the time bubble. Now that they basically made this whole test pointless by killing the Dark Lord, Yogiri wants to get out of there before anyone figures out what he has done. But before they leave, Lionel hears his name called out by the entitled girl that dragged him into this competition in the first place. She is demanding that he hand over some of his apologies so she can replenish her mana before the test begins, and he complies but tells her that the apology do not work for anyone other than him. She leaves Lionel behind, and after picking up his gem, the team can finally get moving. Thankfully, since they were delayed, the people who went ahead have kindly and involuntarily showcased all the traps that were set in the tower. So now their job should be much easier since they just have to avoid triggering the remaining traps in the tower. It shouldn't be too hard, but then again, they've got Lionel on their team. Immediately after Rick had warned everyone to be careful, he steps on a magic circle and gets his chest impaled. Thankfully, he still has some crystals left, so he is able to recover from the severe damage he just took. Since this keeps happening so often, Danara suggests that he just keeps one crystal in his hand at all times. Now confident that he should be safe, he goes running into an unexplored room by himself, and from the sound of the blood-curdling scream coming from him, I don't think he's having a good time in there. Rick runs in after him and finds a woman called Teresa standing in the middle of the blood-covered room. Rick can't believe she would do something like this since she's meant to be one of the Knights of the Divine King. But this is well within what she would usually do, especially since this is how you're supposed to gain points in this tower. In fact, she ended up killing so many people just for the hell of it that she got her title as a knight stripped from her. So since she is currently unemployed, she decided to try her hand at becoming the Divine King as well, and it's a little bonus that she gets to kill as many people as she likes. Rick tells the others to get out of there as soon as possible, but Danara tells him they can't move because there are currently dozens of wires strung up all across the room. Teresa is impressed she managed to figure that out before they could fall for the trap. But regardless, that won't save them. Rick puts himself in the front line and tells the others that he will keep Teresa at bay while they find a way to get out of there. However, Teresa has no intention of letting any of them get out of there alive. As she starts striking at Rick with her threads, she proves to be a strong opponent, and Rick is doing well to keep up with her attacks thus far. However, Danara can tell that Teresa is still holding back, so if she gets serious, he may be unable to handle her. However, it's never going to come to that, as Yogiri tells her shut the f up bitch and she dies Teresa is immediately on her way to the afterlife. Now that she's dead, they remember they had a guy named Len with them, and Yogiri finds his severed hand on the ground. It's pretty unlucky that he got his hand with a crystal chopped off, but at least he is still alive. The group heads down and has now made it to the 98th floor of the tower, where they are informed that this place counts as a safe zone. They are free to rest while they are here, and there are even rooms provided for them. Yagiri suggests that since this place is safe, they can split up and do their own things for a while. Rick is okay with splitting up, but he asks if Yagiri and Danara will be alright by themselves. They say they are fine, and Lionel agrees as well, since he has run out of apology for the day. And if he leaves this place without one, he may die for real this time. 
Since everyone is in agreement, Rick says he will be going on ahead, and Lionel gets ready so he can barricade himself for survival. Yagiri asks Danara if she would like to rest for a while, but unfortunately, there is currently only one room available in the safe zone, and you know what that means. Danara gets nervous and reminds Yagiri that Moko is still here and she will be able to see if anything happens. He tells him to shut up, and Moko tells him I don't have any problem. Yagiri wastes no time in taking off his clothes. I know guys what you are thinking but he has just wanted to change and go to sleep. Meanwhile, Mid Mag has finally come, so after nearly dying 15 times today, Lionel receives his next batch of apology and gets a great deal on them as well. He received 100 apologies and a guaranteed ultra rare Gossa. He is excited and goes for the Gossa pull immediately, but instead of a weapon or armor of some sort, he gets a woman. He is thinks he has won the lottery, but this is the goddess that brought him to this world, but she's not here to join him in his adventurous night. Lionel gets upset and even I was also upset guys. She just wanted to pop in and see if he is still alive. She also tells him that she updated his save point so now no matter how many times he dies, he will always respawn here. She then disconnects from the body and vanishes, and Lionel has a lone knight like me. Tell me in the comment guys if you are alone in night or not. Meanwhile, in the tower control center, the homunculus girl informs the master that there is a problem. From their calculations, the number of souls that the tower has collected doesn't match the number of people that have died. However, he doesn't see it as that big of an issue since they still have more than enough souls available to run the barrier. Another point of concern is that they will also need to replenish their stock of half-demons who power the barrier. Elsewhere, we see a blue-haired girl running through a field with explosions happening around her. She points out that it is rude to attack someone on site when you don't even know what they want yet, but the guy is already well aware that she is here to recruit him. The girl was indeed asked to recruit him and was given orders to kill anyone who refused to join, so she makes sure she has the right person by scanning him with her eye. The guy is called Seidu, and he used his gift to build this colony and live a peaceful life here. He doesn't want that messed up by AI, so he uses his power to attack her with a bunch of tentacles. Unfortunately for him, AI has hacks built in since none of his abilities are working. Seidu takes out his sword, which has a high Luke stat on it so her ability can't affect it. But that just means she has to avoid getting hit by Seidu's sword, and she does so quite effortlessly before holding him at knife point and slitting his throat. She then gets a message from her talking knife, informing her that she's got another job to complete and needs to head to the city of Hanabusa in order to take out AI. She's annoyed that she doesn't even get to catch her breath but starts heading out to complete the mission. But before she goes, a face she never thought she'd see again shows up. Hanakawa somehow managed to survive in the forest for a while, and he was eventually saved by Seidu, who took him in and let him live in his barony. However, now that AI has killed him, there's no one left to protect this place, so he desperately wants to go with her. Back to Yogiri and Danara. Danara was still sleeping when Mocha started calling for her to wake up. She opens her eyes and finds Yogiri's face buried in her chest, though it's not intentional since he is still asleep. However, that wasn't the reason Mocha woke her up. It was because she is stuck in the wall. Mocha had been watching them sleep earlier when Yogiri started hugging Danara in his sleep. And thinking some action was about to happen, she went into the wall to avoid interrupting anything. But then she got curious and tried to take a peek. And now she's slowly getting sucked into the wall due to a mechanism in the tower that captures spirits. Yogiri finally wakes up and asks if he can do anything to save her. But Danara has already given up and thanks Mocha for all the time they spent together. Since Mocha was being sucked into the wall, Yogiri walks up to it and locates the mechanism causing the suction. Then he disables it, which somehow works. Mocha is relieved that she managed to survive despite being dead for centuries. She wonders about the reason behind the tower sucking up souls. Yogiri isn't sure, but after all that has happened, he tells Danara that she needs to be ready because he's going to kill anybody who even remotely seems like a threat from this point onward. Danara already knew they would need to kill people who try to harm them, and she's thankful to Yogiri for always protecting her, which makes Yogiri blush. Meanwhile, Ai is approaching Yogiri and the others in the tower, but they encounter the dragon. Hanakawa thinks they should run away. But AI doesn't see it as a big deal and comments that she doesn't think a dragon that big should be able to fly. Immediately after she says that, the dragon falls to the ground. AI's ability doesn't just cause a forceful impact, it literally alters reality to match her beliefs. So, no matter how delusional she is, she's always right. However, if her opponent has good luck, then she can't use her ability on them. 
The dragon remains a threat, but it gets beheaded by an aggressor who gathers intel from it before heading into the barrier, side to follow it, with Hanako reluctantly dragged along. Meanwhile, Yogiri and Donora continue to progress through the tower by overcoming challenges. However, the creator of the tower becomes enraged and personally intervenes to stop them. He explains that the tower was created to maintain the barrier and keep the Dark Lord sealed, so he can't allow it to be destroyed. Yagiri offers to stop destroying the tower if they are let out, but the creator, Egelja, isn't willing to negotiate. Before Egelja can threaten them, Yagiri c**ks him. Continuing through the tower, they encounter two swordsmen dueling in a stadium and a man named Misaki sitting on a throne, which he must have carried all the way there. One of the fighters, a girl battling a bunny, is revealed to be a half-demon. But Yogiri chooses not to intervene and simply requests to pass through the exit peacefully. However, Misaki, full of arrogance, refuses to let them go without a fight. As Misaki calls out his servants to fight, Yogiri swiftly dispatches them all, including Misaki himself. Impressed by Yogiri's power, the demon girl requests to join him. And they continue their journey together. If you want guys part 2, then tell me in the comment. That's it for this video. Watch the following video, and I will see you in next one.